Welcome to another episode of The Dissection, where we palapalistically evaluate SPTPT. And what is PTPT we are going to see this week? This is going to be one of the most historic and significant weeks in the history of the South African democracy post-apartheid. And the first thing we're going to discuss is the announcement that came out today that the election of the president of South Africa, of the Speaker of Parliament, is going to happen this Friday, four days from today. So let's look at what the Chief Justice said. And this is a media statement that was issued. I'm just going to go through it because I think it's all pertinent and it's all relevant. On the 2nd of June, 2024, the Electoral Commission of South Africa declared the 2024 national and provincial election results. On the 6th of June, 2024, the IEC handed the lists of designated member, members of parliament and members of provincial legislatures to the Chief Justice of the, the Republic of South Africa, who in turn handed the lists over to the Secretary of, of Parliament in preparation for the first sitting of the National Assembly. Section 51.1 of the Constitution provides that after an election, the first sitting of the National Assembly must take place at a time and on a date determined by the Chief Justice, but not more than 14 days after the election results have been declared. By virtue of the powers vested in the Chief Justice, in terms of Section 51.1 of the Constitution, Chief Justice Zondo has determined that the first sitting of the National Assembly shall be on Friday, 14 June 2024, at 10 a.m. The 14th of June falls within the prescribed period. The determination is attached. During the first sitting of Parliament, the Chief Justice will administer the prescribed oath or affirmation, as the case may be, to members of the National Assembly. This is an oath or affirmation of faithfulness to the Republic and obedience to the Constitution, which Section 48 of the Constitution requires members of the National Assembly to take before they may perform their duties as members of the National Assembly. You can tell I used to read uh, in, in, in primary school and high school. Uh, 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 uh. You can tell. You can tell. Right. After the members of the National Assembly have been sworn in or after the prescribed affirmation has been administered, the Chief Justice will then preside over the election of the Speaker of the National Assembly. Once the Speaker of the National Assembly has been elected, he or she will then preside over the election of the Deputy Speaker. After the Deputy Speaker has been elected, the Chief Justice will then take over again and preside over the election of the President. Dun, 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 dun. That's really where it's going to get lit. The Secretary to Parliament has received formal correspondence in this regard and will henceforth make the necessary arrangements for the first sitting of the National Assembly to take place in accordance with the determination made by the Chief Justice. As far as the National Council of Provinces is concerned, the Chief Justice has determined that the first sitting will be on Saturday, 14 June 2024. The Chief Justice will sway in admin and administer the prescribed affirmation to members of the National Council of Provinces and thereafter preside over the election of the chairperson of the National Council of Provinces. Thereafter, the, Chief Just the chairperson of the National Council of Provinces will preside over the election of the deputy chairperson of the National Council of Provinces. Right, landing that plane. As far as the sittings of the provincial legislatures are concerned, the Chief Justice has designated judges' presidents in the provinces to determine the first sittings of the provincial legislatures in their respective provinces. In terms of the Constitution, such sittings are required to take place not more than 14 days after the declaration of election results. The judges' presidents will administer the prescribed oath or affirmation to the members of the provincial legislatures, preside over the election of the Speaker of the Legislature and the election of the Premier. So we're going to have to wait and see what happens with each of the provinces, KZN, Gauteng, those kind of provinces. That's where it's really significant, right? And then the last thing that they issued was the declaration, which um, basically says the following, right? The Chief Justice of the Republic of South Africa hereby determines in terms of section 51.1 of the Constitution that the first sitting of the National Assembly shall be on Friday, the 14th of June at 10 a.m. So that's the first thing. So now it's, it's, getting, it's getting lit. It's getting real. 
we're going to have to see how political parties navigate, maneuver, all of this particular stuff. But it's also making me think whether or not we are close to something that was discussed or whether or not there is going to now be a confidence and supply agreement between the ANC and the IFP. It doesn't look like there's support within the ANC for a DA-IFP formal coalition. The terms that the DA gave to the ANC may seem too harsh to members of the ANC, particularly some of their um, economic policies and some of their financial requests. So it may very well be that the next best option for the markets, if they cannot get this particular deal, and also the next best option for the Ramaphosa faction, is to actually do what is known as a confidence and supply agreement. There was a document that was leaked, and then it was declared fake. I don't know whether it was fake, fake, but we'll see. Here's, here's the document. It's called Pathways to Viable uh, Government After the 2024 Elections. It was a draft document. It was circulated on the internet, and uh, the ANC said it was a fake document. But I want to refer to one. It, it's. I'm not sure it was not an authentic document because it's quite elaborate and nobody would really go through the trouble of making all of this um, unless it was a, a you know internal party document there's so many leaks these days that um when there's contestation like this documents like this do emerge anyway um here's what the the document said about a confidence and supply agreement the first option that they had was a coalition with the da and ifp we know that the coalition pure coalition is not going to necessarily show up. The second one was a confidence and supply agreement. Here's what it says about a confidence and supply agreement. A confidence and supply agreement refers to a formal agreement with one or more parties in which those parties commit to support the government in confidence motions and to pass budgets in appropriation votes supply. So the confidence is to prevent you from being voted out in a vote of no confidence and also to pass your budget. Unlike a coalition, junior parties do not usually receive positions in cabinet and are free to vote independently on other legislation. A confident and supply agreement provides greater stability than a minority government as it assures the government of majority support in parliament. An agreement of this kind would avoid the complexities of a coalition while enabling the ANC to form a government. It would have many advantages of the coalition described in option one while preserving, I'm not going to read option one, but option one was coalition with the DA and AFP, while preserving the independence of all parties and enabling government to carry out its policy agenda without the constraints of a formal coalition agreement. However, the key disadvantage would be the absence of a majority in parliament to pass legislation other than budgets. A significant amount of political work would also have to be carried out within the ANC and broader mass democratic movement to ensure buy-in of this approach, as historically these parties have not been seen as allies of the Congress agenda in the country. Broader ANC voting constituencies would also have to be convinced of this approach, given that it may be perceived as selling out for a neoliberal agenda. I know the next word is agenda. Yes, it's agenda. <laughs> I got it. There are, however, a number of advantages given the flexibility this option provides. Both the DA and IFP would be likely to agree to this arrangement in order to exclude the EFF and the MK from government. If necessary to secure their participation in a confidence and supply agreement, the DA and IFP could be offered greater control in parliament, such as through the position of speaker and committee leadership. In Gauteng and Wazulu Natal, where the ANC majority is narrower, it may be necessary to allocate certain positions in the provincial executive to junior parties without relinquishing control of the province. province. The table below summarizes examples where this model has been used elsewhere in the world, including the Tradu government in Canada and the left-wing Sanchez government in Spain. So I'm going to post that graphic up here, but obviously it's giving some examples, Spain, Canada, Turkey, Australia, India, where you have this confidence and supply agreement. So we'll know on Friday where things stand and whether or not this is now what's going to actually happen, whether it's going to be the confidence and supply agreement. So moving on, there's a lot going on and I want to move on. Moving on, there was a letter that was sent on the 7th of June to the Chief Justice of South Africa and to the Secretary of Parliament from Zungu Incorporated. And these are the attorney attorneys for the MK party. It says as follows, Dear Sirs, re-proposed sitting of the First National Assembly. 
We Act Forum Contos is a party, a duly registered political party. It has come to the attention of our client that in the past 24 hours, each one of the Honorable Chief Justice and or the Secretary to Parliament have participated in the handing over or receipt, receipt of purported list of persons nominated by their political parties for membership of the National Assembly and or other provincial legislatures. Then it goes on. Making statements indicating that both the announcement of the date on which the first sitting of the National Assembly envisaged in sections of the Constitution and the swearing-in ceremony of itself are imminent, imminent and likely to happen within days, aligning themselves with the particular and disputed interpretation of relevant provisions of the Constitution. We are instructed to inform you that our client intends to challenge the validity of the declaration of results by the IEC pursuant to which the lists, aforesaid lists were complied. If the said decision reviewed and set aside, then the envisaged process, process will be legally incompetent. For ease of reference, a copy of the relevant letter of demand sent to the IEC is annexed here to Marks X. As a result of its genuine grievances, inter alia set out in Annex X, our client has taken a decision for its 58 nominees to boycott and not to attend the envisaged first sitting scheduled to take place within the next nine days or so. This will mean that the National Assembly will not have the requisite number of 350 sworn-in members to constitute it, to constitute it a, a question which is totally different to the quorum required for a properly constituted National Assembly. To the extent that you may dispute our interpretation, a court of law will be called upon to resolve that dispute as discussed below. And... The interpretation that Section 53.1b of the Constitution applies to the question of proper constitution or composition of the National Assembly is highly disputed. In the circumstances, we are instructed to demand, as we hereby do, that either or both of the two offices, which are currently seized with convening and or conducting the aforesaid first sitting, namely the Office of the Chief Justice and or the Secretary of Parliament, must refrain from doing so, as this will constitute an infringement on the constitutional rights of our clients, its nominees, its members, and more importantly, its voters, and indeed South African people as a whole. In that regard, we request, you, we request that you give an undertaking that you will desist from such conduct by no later than 10 p.m. on Sunday, 9 June, failing which our client will be left with no option but to approach the appropriate court of law to seek inter alia an order interdicting you from going ahead. Due to the urgency of the matter, we've taken the liberty of sending this joint letter to the two relevant offices and to do so separately to each. In, in the event of, undertake, of the undertaking not being furnished, please kindly furnish us with the details of your attorneys plus permission to serve the relevant court papers on them. We look forward to hearing from you as a matter of exigency. Then they go on. Given, given, no, 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 no. I'm, I've mixed up my pages. So, so this is what um, the the ANC then said to, um, not the ANC. This is what the MK said to the speaker and to um, you know the Chief Justice. Like, hey, hold up, Secretary of Parliament, rather Secretary of Parliament and the Chief Justice, hold up, slow your horses. We don't want this thing to go in. Our fifty-eight guys are not going to come in. You're not going to have. In enough members to constitute. Look, I think that they are going to lose this legal question about whether or not you need all of the members present to constitute the parliament. I think they're going to lose that. If they go to the constitutional court, the constitutional court is going to interpret this in a way that will favor the commencement of parliament, not necessarily uh, disorder and chaos and, uh, you know, something that can cause a risk to the markets. So I don't think that they're going to win this particular case. And the development that then comes up, right, is as follows. The Secretary of Parliament responds to Zungu, right, and says the following. Dear Mr. Zungu, your letter dated 7 June 2024 to the Secretary of Parliament referred to me for a response bears reference. I note your concerns and interpretation of Section 46 of the Constitution. I do not agree with your interpretation and am of the view that the Secretary to Parliament is legally bound to facilitate the first sitting of Parliament at a date and time to be determined by the Chief Justice. Accordingly, unless and until the results of an election are set aside by a court pursuant to Section 49.3 of the Constitution, Parliament must ensure that the sittings take place as directed. I take this opportunity to remind you that the first sitting of the Assembly and National Council of Provinces will be physical sittings and arrangements have been made by the Parliamentary Administration to ensure that all members who appear on the parliamentary list on the IEC list as handed over to the Chief Justice are provided with travel and accommodation to attend the sittings and the associated onboarding activities scheduled in Cape Town. 
given your responses, sorry, given your correspondence, we will instruct the officials to cancel all agreements, sorry, all arrangements in respect of accommodation and flights for your client's elected members so as not to incur, sorry, incur fruitless and wasteful expenditure in contravention of the Financial Management of Parliament and Provincial Legislatures Act of 2009. So this is what they get, right, from Parliament. Parliament says we're going to go through, we're not going to wait for you, and in addition, in addition, we're going to cancel your flights, we're going to cancel your accommodation. Right. So in the first instance, I think MK is going to lose the legal dispute. Now, when it comes to the issue of cancelling their flights, I think that sets a hard line in the sand and perhaps is something that should not have been done by the Secretary of Parliament and Parliamentary Administration. I think that it sends a message across that the Parliamentary Administration is hostile to the MK party. And the reason why I think this is something that should be concerning is because you don't want to have a parliamentary administration which seems, or even parliamentary security, which seem to have a horse in the race. They are supposed to be neutral. They are supposed to render their services regardless. So the fact that there are going to be legal disputes, etc., etc., I don't think necessitates or allows them to say, we are now going to cancel the hotel accommodation and the flights for these particular members of parliament. It creates a different system of treatment for different members of parliament. And I think that can be a cause for concern. And we should all maybe put a question mark on that conduct, even though I think the MK is going to lose this case. I think the constitutional court is not going to rule in their favor. I also think that it may be time for the MK to think about playing the cards that they currently have. They are going with this strategy of trying to undermine the credibility of the election, almost what we saw or have seen happening with Trump, where he does not want to admit that he lost in 2020. And in some respects, it's working for him because he's ahead in the polls, but it's not something that's necessarily going to improve the facilitation of their work or bring uh, other people maybe who are on the fence into their fold, right? But this looks like what they're adopting. I don't think that it's necessarily a good strategy. I think right now, you got the 2.3 million votes, you've got the 15%, you've got the 58 seats, more seats than the EFF. So go to parliament, uh, play the game of parliament, make deals that you need to make. It looks like IFP may be willing to make a deal with MK, but if the confidence and supply agreement uh, is instituted across the provinces, what we may see is the um, ANC governing Wazulu Natal. So to MK, I think go to parliament, right? To ANC IFP, I think it's a bad idea to govern through this kind of a confidence and supply agreement, Wazulu Natal. You guys lost Wazulu Natal. You lost it. And now you are negotiating in a way that is going to undermine the plurality of views in Wazulu Natal that that province should be governed by MK. I think that allow MK to make whatever coalitions it can, give IFP the freedom to actually work with MK in Wazulu Natal and let them run that province. I think if you don't do that, you're going to create a very, very sour sentiment in that province that I think in two years' time we're going to be talking about, or maybe not even in two years' time. I think that is a very tricky um, position to take. And it doesn't have um, some form of electoral legitimacy. It's, it's possible for you to do it. But considering where you placed as the ANC to remain in control of that province, when the people voted for MK, 40, 45% voted for MK, I think that's going to be a problem. Because MK got votes more than you in, in Wazulu Natal. And you have 40%. And you're using that 40% to form a, a government for national. For them to have 45% and for you to deny them a government of their of their province, which they won technically, um, I think is going to be something that will cause a lot of animosity, resentment, sourness, and actually could hurt the ANC going further into the local government elections. So it's just my view, uh, both to ANC and to MK. MK, play the cards you are dealt in parliament. ANC, I'm not sure about confidence and supply uh, for, uh, how, uh, not for Gauteng, for what you call, for Wazulu Natal. Anyway, to add another twist, 
were evaluating Spiti Piti. What then happened is that the gentleman, the gentleman known as Jablani Kumalo, who I call Judas is Kumalo Shugela because he Kumadle Shugela. Our nigga is a farm, the sugar that he got at a farm somewhere to basically sell out his people. I, Jablani Kumalo, and making this public statement in my capacity as leader of Mkonto Wesizwe, our members of parliament will be present for their swearing in on the designated date. The purported communication, the purported MK communication to the effect that parliament is not constituted based on the absence of 58 members of parliament is misguided in law and frankly embarrassing. I, I don't know if he wants to be calling his own party embarrassing unless he's now committed to being the sellout of the party because how do you... Anyway... The true leader of the MK being myself does not agree with it. Parliament has been constituted with 40, 400 members as the, conf, as the confirmation of 400 elected members following the elections. Should any MK member of parliament not avail themselves for understandable fear of victimization by Zuma and his clique, will not itself be basis for parliament not to continue with its business of swearing in members of parliament and continue with the scheduled business on the date chosen by the Chief Justice. Mr. Zuma will not continue to abuse our democratic process, the will of the people, and continue to undermine our parliament and constitutional institutions such as our courts, and not least their leader, Chief Justice. I confirm that I, on behalf of the MK, accept the results as pronounced by the Independent Electoral Commission, and no amount of staple conspiracy theories by Mr. Zuma will collapse this nation. Amanda, President Chablani Kumalo Judas is Kumalo Chugera. So that's what he has purportedly said. Now, some of these documents that have been circulated, I cannot or uh, like independently verify the authenticity thereof. They have been circulating on social media. But I have a question now about the Jablani Kumalo statement. If he goes to parliament, if he goes to parliament, how will he get there? Because uh, the parliamentary officials say they're not arranging flights. So he's going to go there with his own money, right? And he's going to get his own accommodation. So which leader, of which leader of the party is parliament listening to? There's a little bit of a contradiction there. Uh, in any event, we'll have to see what happens on Friday. If he shows up by himself on, 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 on Friday, that's also going to just be like glaring, right? I think that the issue that was taken to the electoral court, they need to make a determination on that quickly. There needs to be no ambiguity as to who is the leader of this party. I think that... Uh, the, you know, Advocate Dali Mbofu SE will win that case for MK. I don't think Jablani has a case, but I think it's better that they resolve this fast. We don't want these situations where there's this kind of confusion. And right now it may be deliberate from the opponents of the MK, but this is also not very helpful. It's additional chaos. I think my cautionary note is that everyone has to be careful. Everyone has to understand that this is serious business. You know, I joke around a lot because life... Life is, 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 is too serious. You need to find places where you can laugh at life, at yourself. And I do that often. It's, it's my um, mental health therapy. But at the same time, these are serious issues that we, we, we are discussing here. And I think that some of these strategies, some of these games within a game, are not to the betterment of the democratic condition and to the credibility of the institution of democracy. These snake and dagger type of strategies are generally not helpful. So I think everyone should really approach Friday with a serious amount of respect, a serious amount of, you know, um, tolerance for all of the different political parties. The fact that you don't agree with one political party or another political party should not allow you or should not encourage you to call these people evil, to call them enemies, and that applies to the Democratic Alliance or the EFF. The accusations of intimidation of party members by Jablani Kumalo in and of themselves are also things that I think we need to be very careful about because he's trying to actually say that no one in the MK can make their independent decision or that they don't feel aggrieved by some of the voting issues that they saw in Guazulu Natal. Of course, I don't think these things were material. I've already said I think this election was free and fair, and I stand on that. I've not been able to independently, using my own eyes, verify uh, materiality. I've seen some irregularities, but I've not been able to verify materiality of those irregularities, so I can't back any narrative to that effect. However, I think we all need to just move with a certain amount of caution, a certain amount of respect 
for the process. And that also means respect for the other parties, which is why I say that I don't think it was correct for the parliamentary administrative officers to say we're cancelling flights, we're cancelling uh, uh, accommodation, especially if they, they, they are also going to entertain this idea that Jablani Kumalo is the leader, right? I think that even though it would have been um, a waste if they don't show up, right, I think that um, that's something that just comes with the territory and you have to um, bake in those losses. Anyway, those are my views. What do you guys think? What do you guys think? Let's have a conversation. Thank you so much to everybody who has subscribed. We've crossed over 11,000 subscribers. Thank you so much. Next target, 15,000. But I want to thank you so much. And if you're watching this video and you haven't subscribed, guess what? 89% of the people watching have not subscribed. Be one of those people who just... This is part of how YouTube sees that you love this content and it helps them, you know, uh, show others this content as well. A lot of analysis these days, quality analysis, you're not going to get on mainstream media because mainstream media is playing factional games. You know, some publications support Ramaphosa. Some publications oppose Ramaphosa. Some publications think that, no, we shouldn't platform these particular people or those particular people. Some analysts, you know, are working for administrations. So we have to use YouTube creatively to have these kind of conversations. And I'm putting my hand up. I want to be one of the YouTube content creators who you can come to for honest conversation, robust conversation. And I'm going to try to be very consistent so that we can have these conversations as frequently as possible. So thank you so much. If you haven't subscribed, please consider just, I really appreciate that. Till the next one.